Welcome. It is always great to be in the house of the Lord. We shall do the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endure it forever. Let the house of Israel say, his mercy endure it forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The right hand of the Lord has stricken with power. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us enjoy as we worship today.
Good morning, church. Uh, please stand with me now as we invite the Lord to be with us this morning. Almighty Father, we gather today with joy and exuberance to celebrate the wonderful, incredible victory of your Son, Jesus Christ. May the words we sing and the smiles we share with each other be an expression of our eternal gratefulness and of our willingness to live in your redeemed world. So send your spirit among us now as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 166, Christ the Lord is Risen Today.
special thank you to all of our musicians for such beautiful music on this special weekend of remembering our Lord's resurrection. I want to especially thank Mark Hussey, who's been at the organ bench for us these past two weeks. Thank you so much for filling in for us. Make sure you take note of the announcements in the bulletin. Next week is our monthly potluck and uh, family worship weekend, so please remember that. And uh, Koinonia this week on Wednesday evening will take on a different nature. It will be a time of fellowship and interaction. Take note of that announcement. I'd like to invite Alma Wesley up as she wants to, sh as she will share with us some of the good things that the women's ministry has been doing. And while she comes, a special thank you to all of you who worked so hard on the many activities of last weekend. We had three big meals that were being prepared, and a lot of you spent a lot of time on that. Thank you so much. Alma. Good morning, church. We miss some of you ladies on Sunday. We had a most beautiful time together at a sweet life. At this sweet life was divided into six sections and in between we had wonderful music led by um, Mavis, our music guru, and special music by Teresa Wilcox. And we were blessed by that too. Now, one part was life is sweet when we trust God. We studied about the lady that fed Elijah she trusted God, and you know how many years they were fed? Three years. So that is trusting God. Life is sweet when we make time for friends. We had some time together, and we gave each other a little token of friendship. And the meal was delightful, and I'd like to thank Beth Johnson. I don't see her over there. She saved the day for us on the menu, and it was delightful. Thank you so much. Also, life is sweet when we are nourished by Jesus. We learn certain facts about bread, about things that are made with bread, but it's not until you are fed that you are being nourished. And when we spend time with God is when we are nourished spiritually. And uh, Teresa Bergman, was the person that helped us to prepare these kits. And if any one of you would love to have the recipe, we are willing to give it to you. They are cinnamon pancakes. And very practical because we put it together, the bag is inside, and then you take this little token and give it to somebody else. It's uh, the serving others. So this is your gift to give to somebody. And it is in the giving that is the delight, isn't it? Also, um, life is sweet when we share. And where is Kelly? Kelly Fantamillas had also a very special part on that. And I tell you, those two little boys were such gracious part of our program because even though it was for ladies, those two little boys were there with us and, and just filled out our time together. Then we went home with a little bit of homework. And this is the little homework that we made, a little um, thing for our Bible. And this is the spending, the spending time with you, you with Jesus. And we follow the directions. And every little part of this has a significant uh, symbol. So spending time with Jesus, spending time with our friends was a very delightful part of our program. And out of that, one of our ladies, um, our matriarch, or Fibaro, suggested that we needed to do a little bit more in sharing how we met Jesus. So ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to. Uh, when you're invited to a Vespers that we're doing, we're going to be doing that in the fellowship hall. So, and it was for children. I'm sorry. I'm so used to the children. For ladies of all ages. And we were just so happy 
that uh, one of our young ladies was with us too. Thank you so much and keep praying for us. We have to ignite the church for Jesus. Thank you. Will the children come forward, please? Oh, by, by the way, as the children come forward now for the story, the rest of you would like to get up, mingle, uh, meet someone you don't know, give them a, more, a warm handshake or a hug. Good morning, boys and girls. <laughs> what season of the year is this? Easter. Easter. But in the, there are four seasons in the year. Which one is it? Springtime. In springtime, everything is blooming and growing and hatching. And let me show you what we're doing at the preschool. We are growing some celery and lettuce and beets and uh, you know this doesn't happen just because someone so powerful allows these things to happen right and I want to tell you that you are going to help me tell the story of Easter the true story of Easter and this happened about 2000 more than 2000 years ago so I'm going to give you a little plastic container. When I call on your number, then you open it. Don't open anything until I ask you, OK? Can we do that? All right. Can you help me? Just let's go ahead and give them to the kids. Don't open it. Okay, unfortunately, we only have 12 of them, but, you know, you can share. Now, who made the bunnies? Who made the chickies? Just call it out. God made them. Well, we are going to learn what happened that first Easter, okay? Okay. Look it, she found a donkey, a little donkey. And this reminds me of Jesus when he asked the disciples, go and ask, you will see a donkey, and you tell them Jesus needs it. And Jesus rode on a donkey as he entered into Jerusalem, correct? Number two, who has number two? Okay, she's got what? Money. Silver. Whoops. Are you okay? 30 sil pieces of silver was the price that Judas sold Jesus for. 
So we remember this. Who has number three? Who has number three? Okay, open it up. She has a cup. Jesus asked his disciples that they were going to spend the last time together and they had the last supper. And when the fruit of the vine, which is the grape juice, he shared with the disciples and he said, every time that you drink this, remember. Remember what I'm doing for you. Okay, who's number, who has number four? Okay. What did they do after they finished the Last Supper? They went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Come, help me. He knew he was going to have a hard time ahead of him, so he needed to talk with his father. So this tells us that we also need pray constantly to our Father in heaven. Okay, who has number five? Okay. While in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas came and betrayed Jesus. Jesus was taken to Pilate, and he was hit by what? The whip. 30 of them on his back. Can you imagine? And he did this for you and me. Can you put it together? Okay, who has number six? Okay, who has number six? Okay, she's got a spear. The prophecies that Jesus fulfilled were 400 prophecies. Did you know that? You didn't. I didn't either. But I learned that every prophecy that Jesus fulfilled, even when the prophecy said that his bones were not going to be per uh, broken, his side was pierced so that they knew that he was already dead and he didn't have to have his bones broken. Seven. Who has number seven? Okay. Oh, my goodness. When the disciples said, we will never, never leave you, Jesus. We will be by you. And Peter said, I will always be by your side, Jesus. But then Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows one time. And that's what happened, didn't it? And Peter felt very, very bad, badly. Number eight. Who has number eight? I need number eight. Okay. Jesus was taken to the cross. His hands and feet were pierced. And he died for you and I on the cross. Who has number nine? Before he was taken to the cross, he was given a, a crown of thorns. And they were, this crown was put on his head and he was hurting. And he wanted to do that because of you and I. Who has number 10? Okay. After he was taken down from the cross, he was wrapped in white linen, just like the Bible said he would. And who has number 11? He was put in a grave right in a tomb and a big big boulder was put in front of that hole and do you know that when the bible says that a guard was sent to guard that that tomb because they didn't want jesus or the friends to say that jesus had risen 
They knew he was dead, and they wanted him to stay there forever. A guard is 38, no, 32 soldiers, and they were taking three rounds. Everyone was eight, eight, and eight. So you did not want to lose your spot, because if you lost your spot as a soldier, everybody will be punished. So they wanted to be sure that Jesus was not going to come out of that uh, tomb. And who has number 12? Okay. So it was Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning when the ladies came to put ointment on Jesus' body and they opened. Do you want to open it? They opened, they went to the tomb. What did they find? What is in here? It's empty. They found an empty tomb because boys and girls, that's what Easter's all about. An empty tomb because Jesus rose and he went to heaven with Jesus, with his father and he's waiting for you and I and making special place for us to live forever. So, when you're thinking about Easter again, remember, Easter is about Jesus dying for you and for me and being in heaven so we can be with him someday soon, okay? You may go to your class upstairs, and thank you so much. As the deacons come forward to collect today's offering. Today's offering is for church expense. Now, it has been asked what church expense is used for. Two weeks ago, I was in Sablet school class and the birthday came and said, Irvin, I need to show you something. So I went with him and there was water dripping out of the ceiling in the high school group classroom. There was a leak in one of the pipes. We then called a repair person who came on the Sabbath and repaired it. It cost us $1,400. Those are the kinds of things that the church expense goes for to take care of. So when you're filling out your tithes envelope, remember church's budget, not only tithes, remember church budget also. The deacons will collect the offering at this time.
Father God, we realize that everything that we have, we receive from you. Accept this return in offering and tithe that we bring to you to further the message of salvation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, choir. And now it is time for our intercessory prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a burden, I invite you to come to the front as this time as we, as we pray and uh, invite you to come forward while we sing our prayer song as we come to you in prayer.
If you are able, I invite you to kneel with me as we pray. Dearest Father in heaven, we come to you today on bended knee and bended heart, celebrating the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of this world. We come today, Lord, thanking you for sending us the one who was bruised for our transgression, who was wounded, and whose, by whose stripes we are healed. As we come now, we thank you as we look back on the sacrifice that was made 2,000 years ago so that we could have a hope, a future, a tomorrow. We thank you, Lord, that our, our Savior not only died for us, but broke forth from the tomb. And because he is and has the power of resurrection in him, we too can have that wonderful hope of living forever in your presence. So now as we come today, Father, you see us all here. You know our background. Some of us come with, with burdens that only you alone can hear and bear. Some of us, as we kneel here, have special requests that, again, only you can fulfill. So we ask, Lord, that you will bend your ear low and listen to each heart as we raise our supplications, our requests, our burdens before you. We want to remember this church now in a special way, this, this lighthouse that you have placed in this community. We ask, Lord, that the light will shine brightly to give hope to those around. We ask again, too, Lord, that as, there is, as we listen to the words coming from Pastor Luke today, that your Holy Spirit will touch him with a live coal from off of your altar, and that we will hear what the Spirit has to say to this church. We thank you now that as we go forth this day, we can look forward to a time because of the sacrifice that was made, those nail-scarred hands that have paved a, a way to the place beyond. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, so that we can bask in the sunshine of your presence. We pray this and more in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today's gospel reading is found in Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I invite you all to follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, 
Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, today is a day for great joy. Amen. If you've been tracking with us at Vallejo Drive over the last few weeks, we've been in this season of uh, prayer and fasting. Uh, we've been calling it the journey to the cross. Uh, seven solemn weeks of spiritual discipline. Some of us have taken that prayer and fasting very seriously and tried to intensify our relationship with God, tried to maybe uh, say no to some of those pleasures that we usually want to fill our lives with. But now we're at the end of that journey to the cross. But it's an end that signifies a new beginning. Today we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Today we proclaim with the church over the ages that Christ has conquered sin, conquered death, by dying on a cross, and more importantly, that three days later, God has raised him from the dead. But I want to ask you guys, how important is resurrection to you? Do you think about the resurrection very much? Do we really need the resurrection? You know, I've even spoken to many Christians today who say to me, it doesn't really matter whether Christ actually was raised from the dead or not. As long as I'm a good person and as long as I listen to the teachings of Jesus and follow what he said, I'll be okay. Whether Jesus was literally resurrected or not, that's not a very big issue. And so I want to take as our starting point today a very important text this is Paul talking, and this text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as, I, as we look at this text, let's just see what Paul thought about the resurrection. He says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, 
and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people, what does he say? Most to be pitied. You see, Paul says very emphatically, and I, I agree, that our whole entire faith rests on the truth of the resurrection. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, he says, then you're always going to be a slave. All your addictions, all your bad habits, all of your sins, all of your guilt, your shame, your brokenness, everything, there's going to be no freedom from any of that. And worse still, he says, if there's no resurrection, everything that you believe in is a complete joke. If there's no resurrection, everything you do is a complete lie. And if it isn't true, people ought only to feel pity for you. People should feel sorry for you. Without the belief in the resurrection, he says that everything in your life is ultimately meaningless. If this life is all that there is, your whole journey, your experiences, your memories, your, your dreams, your work, your relationships, your love for your family, all of that ultimately amounts to nothing. Now, of course, you're free to believe in the resurrection or not. That's up to you. But let's get one thing clear. Everything hinges on the resurrection. So is the resurrection difficult to fathom? Is this hard to believe? Indeed it is. And we, let's be honest, right? we generally don't see people die and then come back to life, do we? And in our very modern, secular culture, most people don't believe in any miracles, let alone the idea of a man being raised from the dead. So I get it. This is a belief that's difficult to swallow. And I think, and we're going to do this this morning, I think it's worth asking for a moment, are we crazy? Are we just nuts here? Do we have any good historical evidence for believing in the truth claim of the resurrection? How do we know that the whole thing isn't just made up? That the church just fabricated this fictitious story and then passed it on down to us. Well, just, just for fun, just for interest this morning, we're going to take a look at some of these anti-resurrection arguments. And together we'll try and see how they're not very good. They don't really work. So let's take a look at four of these anti-resurrection arguments that people pose today. The first one is what we call the argument of symbolic myth. The first argument basically says that Jesus' resurrection is a myth. He didn't really come back to life at all, but his teachings and his cause, that's what's important. His cause lives on in our hearts. Jesus' death then is a bit like the death of uh, Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King. Um, what's important is that the things that he stood for are continued to be lived out among his followers. But no one really believes he was physically resurrected. That's just a myth. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem with that theory is simply that nobody dies for a myth, right? Nobody dies for a myth. Yet almost all of Jesus' disciples and subsequent generations of Christians, as you know, were persecuted and martyred for their faith. You see, if someone threatens to execute you because of your belief in the resurrection, and if you know it's a myth, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to say, wait, hang on a minute, I, I get it, it's just a myth. I don't mean that I believe in a uh, literal resurrection. Don't, please don't kill me. That's what you'd say, right? Yet, 
thousands upon thousands of Christians were willing to die for what they clearly believed was literally true, that Christ had been raised up and was still present among them. That's the first one. Second one, even more popular, is called the hallucination theory. Uh, this is the alternative explanation that, as the name suggests, says that the disciples were simply hallucinating, simply imagining that they saw the risen Christ. Now that might seem plausible, but the problem is simply the amount of people who claim to have the same experience. And any psychiatrist will tell you today, for that many people, all to have the exact same hallucination simply does not happen. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we have the text here, he says, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And check this part out. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. He says, most of still are whom alive, though some of them have died. I especially appreciate Paul mentioning here that some of the witnesses who claim to have seen Christ are in fact still alive. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm not trying to hide anything, guys. If you don't believe me, you can go and ask those people directly, and they'll tell you. Now, the next one is, I think, the most amusing. Let's see what you think of argument number three. This one is called the swoon theory. Swoon kind of means, you know, to pass out, to faint, something like that. And so the argument simply is that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross in the first place. For, for whatever reason, they say, Jesus was drugged. He, he fainted, and he simply appeared to be dead. Now, I can tell you that's extremely unlikely, simply for the fact that the Romans were absolute experts at killing people, okay? Uh, and in actual fact, if you were a Roman executioner, and your job was to execute someone, if you failed to carry out your task, you yourself were subject to capital punishment. So in other words, as a Roman uh, soldier given the task of crucifying someone, you made sure that you got the job done. And as you know as well, and even uh, Alma was mentioning this in the children's story earlier, the Bible tells us that blood and water uh, both came out from Jesus' side, which we know now uh, through our, uh, our modern medicine is known as uh, the pericardial effusion. It's the release of water buildup around the membrane of the heart. So Jesus was pierced in his lungs, in his heart, and he died, and therefore that's the reason why the blood and water came out. And I think finally for, for number three, uh, another reason why this swoon theory fails completely is that, think about it, if it was just a half-drugged drowsy Jesus that comes staggering out of the tomb, that's hardly going to make anyone exclaim, this is the resurrected Lord. You're just going to say, Jesus, you've, you know, you've been on drugs, it's time to wake up, you know? Now, the last argument questions the reliability of the resurrection stories in the first place. Uh, people say, and, you know, it's a fair question, people ask, well, how do we know that the New Testament documents aren't just inventions? How do we know they're not just made-up stories? Well, fair question, but I can tell you that any serious historian will tell you that the New Testament texts are the best attested documents in the whole of the ancient world, simply because they... Um, they, they fulfill two criteria, those being that we have lots of them and they date extremely early. So in fact, the New Testament documents are more historically reliable than any other texts that we all accept as fact. So if we want to simply dismiss the New Testament as made up, 
then that means we have to throw away almost everything we know about the ancient world. And remember too, and I'm sure you've heard this, that in these days, uh, the testimony of women was considered extremely unreliable. No one took the witness of a woman seriously. And as you know, the gospel writers uh, use women as the principal witnesses of the empty tomb. So that would be a very, very strange, bizarre thing to include in your story if you were trying to persuade someone of, of something. So all these arguments, I think, end up just making me feel like it's easier just to admit, after all, that what the Bible says happened actually did happen. You can make your own minds up. Now, do all these arguments prove 100% conclusively that the resurrection of Jesus took place? No, of course they don't. And that's obviously where our faith has to come in. But my point here is simply that you are not stupid and you are not anti-intellectual if you believe in the resurrection. And you actually have a lot of good historical evidence to back you up. Now, however, despite everything I've said so far, this is the important thing. You don't want to make Jesus' resurrection simply a matter of intellectual assent. Does that make sense? It's not just about agreeing with a fact. Believing in the resurrection is a self-involving claim that changes the way you see the world and it changes who you pay allegiance to. See, when doubting Thomas touches Jesus' body, he doesn't say, oh wow, God can raise people from the dead. What does Thomas say? He says, my Lord and my Savior. It is no exaggeration to say that the resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in the history of the world. It's the pivotal moment where God acts decisively on behalf of humanity, destroying death and conquering sin once and for all. We have all been redeemed and reconciled to God and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we share in Christ's life and exist in God's new world. But of course, the danger in thinking about the resurrection is that we can become rather selfish. We can get rather preoccupied with connecting the resurrection of Christ simply to everything about my own individual salvation. We say that Jesus rose from the dead so that I can have eternal life. I have been forgiven from all my sins and now I get to be in heaven for all eternity. Well, that's fine and that's, there's obviously some truth to that. That is not quite how the Bible talks about things. You see, salvation in Scripture, salvation is always a communal act. It's always something that takes place in the context of a much wider community. In the Old Testament, God chooses to enter into a covenant with Israel as a nation. In the New Testament, that promise then gets extended into the Gentile world and later to the entire earth. And Christianity is still spreading its message of salvation to all people. Salvation is more than saving individual souls. It's more accurate to say that salvation is God shaping a people for himself. When we think of our resurrection in terms of Jesus, you know, sometimes we think of Jesus just returning to the earth like some spaceman and scooting us off to another planet called heaven. When we think like that, we grossly misunderstand what the Bible is trying to say. See, the Bible's vision of resurrection is not of the earth being annihilated and humanity being taken to some place else. It is rather of our earth being transformed by the kingdom of God. You see, the new Jerusalem comes here and not the other way around. 
In Revelation it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. How beautifully the Revelator depicts our final destination as this marriage between heaven and earth. See, it isn't that God's kingdom and our earth are two separate locations, one here and one there. No, heaven is simply earth with God fully present. God's heaven will wed itself to our earth and completely transform it. That's exactly why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in fact, Paul's theology of the resurrection was so all-encompassing that he talked about it not simply as renewing humanity, but renewing all of creation, hence the name of the, uh, sermons, uh, the, the, the sermon today. He says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. For Paul, the resurrection gives rise to a future hope for the whole world where death and decay will be done away with and where a new creation takes place. God doesn't simply wipe the slate clean and start all over again because to do that wouldn't be to destroy death at all. God abolishes death forever, rescuing everything from its current state of corruption. What God did for Jesus at Easter, he will do not only for those who are in Christ, but for the entire cosmos. So what do we do in the meantime? Do we simply wait? Wait until we get our new resurrected bodies? No. Our job is to lean into this new creation and work alongside God in building his kingdom. Remember, resurrection does not mean starting from scratch. It means fixing what is broken, repairing what is damaged, liberating what is enslaved. So just to shrug our shoulders and say, ah, the world is too much of a mess for anything to be done about it. That is precisely not to believe in the resurrection. Precisely because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we know that God's new world has already broken into the present. And now Christian mission becomes all the more urgent and meaningful. Our last text for today from Paul. He says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, what we do now makes a real difference especially because it has eternal consequences. So I ask you again, do you believe in the resurrection? And I'm going to answer the question for you. Sometimes you believe in the resurrection, and sometimes you don't. You believe in the resurrection when you choose to forgive the unforgivable. You believe in the resurrection when you pray for the people you hate the most. You believe in the resurrection when you put your own agenda on hold and allow yourself to be interrupted by the person who irritates you more than anybody else. 
You believe in the resurrection when you wake up and you say to yourself, how am I going to embody the love of Christ in my life today, in all of my interactions? You believe in the resurrection when you stop, smile, talk to the stranger on the street. You believe in the resurrection when you take care of the planet and use its resources responsibly. You believe in the resurrection when you fight against injustice and violence and racism. You believe in the resurrection when you feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, comfort the sick and clothe the naked. In the resurrection of Christ, we see the first fruit of God's new creation. We see that pain, death, sin, are done away with, and all things are renewed. Our mission is to help to simply lift the veil between those two kingdoms, heaven and earth, and to show that actually they really aren't that far apart. This Easter, may we believe in the resurrection and work together to bring heaven into the here and now and to let God's love burst into the world. If that is your belief, and I'm sure that it is, would you stand with me now and let's sing with energy and with confidence our closing hymn, Because He Lives.
creator of the universe, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory. Through the victory of Christ Jesus, we pray that wherever your image is disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war and greed, the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love and peace. To the glory of your name. Amen.